so I've got a lot of content to cover, and I'm going to go really, really fast. I um, work on the PhoneGap team at Adobe. Uh, I also work on some stuff called uh, Cordova and Topcoat, which I'll get into in more detail in a second. Um, so whenever I go to like these conferences and stuff, the, the thing I hate the most is not seeing like real live code and people doing actual things. As a developer, I want to know if something's legit or not. So I'm going to start out with just a simple hello world to give you guys a sense of of uh, what we can do. Who here has heard of PhoneGap? Fuck, I don't even need to be here. But um, so <laughs> PhoneGap's a, a utility on top of Node.js. You can, if you have Node in, installed, then you have a thing called npm, and you can install it going npm install dash g PhoneGap, and it'll download the internet and install it for you. Once you have it, um, you get this global executable on your command line that you can do a whole bunch of stuff with. And PhoneGap's kind of like a Swiss Army knife for dealing with mobile platforms uh, using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, there's all these commands. Those aren't too important. The part here that's kind of interesting, it will dump out what platforms my current computer's configured to deal with. Uh, this computer that I have right now can deal with all these platforms locally, and uh, it can build these platforms remotely. So let's build an app, my sweet app. No. All right, so I've got this app. Um, why don't we run it on iOS? It's going to check and see if I have iOS, which I do, uh, the iOS SDK, and it's going to compile it, and then it's going to look for a device. If it can't find a device, it's going to install it on a simulator, and then it's going to launch it, presumably. There we go. Cool, so we just built for iOS. Uh, let's build for Android. <laughs> And this takes a little bit longer because it's uh, Java. <laughs> I'm glad you guys appreciated that. So don't look at that ugly guy. Put my timer there. And this should be compiling and installing. Oh yeah, it's doing the Java thing. Just dumping garbage out to my console. If you want to make it slower, you can use Eclipse. Um, oh, and there you go. <laughs> Same app. So that's like zero to hello world in like, I don't know, a couple minutes. Uh, when, you, when you adopt an open source project, it's kind of like adopting a cat. And at first they're really cute, and then eventually you have to feed it and take care of it. Uh, I think a big part of like dealing with open source projects too is understanding where they came from and the philosophy of the founders of the project and, and where they want to see it going. So PhoneGap, like all open source projects, is full of creation myths. And uh, I'm going to tell you guys exactly what did happen. So in 2007, Steve Jobs announces the iPhone. And we're up in Canada at a little shop called Nitobi, and we screamed like little girls, and we drove down to Seattle and bought phones because you couldn't buy them in Canada. And you might remember that Steve Jobs said, hey, guys, you're going to build apps, and you're going to use web technology. And about half of us were like, yeah. And everybody else was like, what the fuck? I don't want to do that. Um, the web tech part was right, but the web sandbox wasn't. And in 2008, they released the iPhone SDK that wasn't the iOS SDK at that time. And um, we were stoked. We didn't care. We like, you know, we're programmers, and we were doing lots of hacking at the time on phones. We had done a bunch of BlackBerry stuff because you're obligated to do that if you're Canadian. And um, <laughs> not so much anymore. Anyway, so we looked into the uh, SDK and we saw, oh my god, there's a web view in there and we can use that and we can instantiate stuff and we can even call JavaScript from it. We're like, this is going to be great. Um, two of our developers, Brock and uh, Rob, went down to, ironically, Adobe to a thing called iPhone Dev Camp and they met with some Apple engineers and they're like, is there any way for us to call from the web view back into native code? And they're like, absolutely not. We totally engineered it so that would be impossible. And then the guy paused and he's like, unless you wanted to do something crazy, like go through the URL. So that's what we did. And by going back and forth through the URL, we're able to get about 400 operations a second or 400 hertz, which is really slow until you think about it and you realize, do you need your geolocation 400 times per second? Probably not. So at that moment, PhoneGap was kind of boring, but it was just for iOS. And then they came back to the office, and I remember they had this old iPhone 1, and they were waving it around, and it had a little Super Mario image on it, and Mario would react to the accelerometer and bounce around. 
Now, at that time, browsers did not have a device motion API. This wasn't done before, and we were super giddy. And this bearded hacker in our office named Joe Bowser was like, I can do that with my Android. And we were like, dude, whatever, that thing's huge. So it was like the first gen Android, that big brick thing that looked like a cash register when you opened it up and it had a resistive touch screen. You had to like stab it with a chopstick to make it do anything. <laughs> so he got it working on Android, no one cared. And then our buddy, <laughs> buddy Dave got it working on BlackBerry. And then we're like, wait a second, this is actually kind of cross-platform, sort of. And uh, that's where it started. In 2009, the whole GitHub thing was totally taking off. Lots of people were downloading and using PhoneGap, and all of a sudden, the best thing ever happened to us. Apple started to reject apps, and they were explicitly calling us out. And the whole web erupted, and the ReadWrite web uh, blog said, Apple hates the web, and they're rejecting PhoneGap. And we're like, why are they doing this? This is all legit. And so we finally got a dialogue with them, and they were like, we reviewed your code. It's fine. But can, when you generate an app, not call it PhoneGap? So I guess when we were generating apps, all of the app identifier bundles came back to the same app, app identifier, phone gap, and they thought they were being spammed by us, um, but they weren't. Uh, nowadays, phone gap makes up about 10% of the top 100 for all categories inside of uh, the app store, so Apple's pretty cool with us. Um, in 2010, the project started to mature, and IBM came to us at OzCon and said, hey, we're gonna start contributing back. And we're like, why? And they're like, you guys need help. And they were totally right. Um, <laughs> at the time, the tests were kind of shoddy. We didn't really have a CLA in, in place, so like a contributor license agreement, and IBM really started to button up the project. At that time, all of our like, consulting work started to come in for mobile, and people were asking us to build apps for them, which was really cool. And we started to leverage uh, the idea of PhoneGap from going out and doing trainings. And I was in Amsterdam, mostly because I wanted to be in Amsterdam, not because I wanted to do a training. And we did this training, it was terrible. The first like four hours were spent like setting up everybody's computers. And I went back to like my hotel after and I'm like, you know, this is dumb. I gotta sit there and I gotta like configure paths on Windows and none of it made sense. So I built a little web service called PhoneGap Build. You post binaries to it and then we'll just, or you post uh, HTML and CSS to it and we'll spit back binaries. Uh, we launched it at JSConfU like a month later and had 80,000 signups uh, right away. In 2011, uh, our founders came to me and they're like, hey Brian, we're being acquired by Adobe. And I laughed, I'm like, yeah, right. And they're like, no, seriously. And I'm like, oh God, I thought you were joking. <laughs> Anyways, it was good. Um, Adobe acquired us to work on PhoneGap effectively full time. And uh, a part of the deal, we donated the source code of it back to Apache uh, as Apache Cordova. In 2012, uh, not doing consulting and just working on open source actually turned out to be a pretty cool thing. We were working on PhoneGap all the time. We were shipping all the time. Uh, we did a release a month that year, and uh, we saw over a million downloads, and it was good. In 2013, we realized that we were too exuberant, and we added too much shit to the project. Uh, PhoneGap had something like over 23 standard APIs, and it was getting a little bit heavy. And every time you installed like a PhoneGap Android app, it asked for permissions to do absolutely everything the device could do, which was kind of sketchy. So we pulled out all this uh, functionality, and we put them into plugins, and we created a plugin architecture so that you could choose, pick and choose sort of which APIs you wanted, but you could also create your own. And I'll show you more of those in a bit. And then Cliffhanger. Talk about 2014 a bit. So people get really confused. They're like, what, what's the difference between PhoneGap and Cordova? And really, there actually isn't one. Cordova is kind of an upstream. It's the basis of PhoneGap. Um, it's what we use to build PhoneGap itself, and other people use to build it. Oh, yeah, that's, that's not a good time for that. Uh, <laughs> as I'm tethering. Um, uh, so. <laughs> BitTorrent Sync is sweet, by the way. Um, that's a totally different topic. Uh, so we, uh, we took Cordova, we wrapped it up with PhoneGap, and then we hooked it up to PhoneGap Build so that you can do remote uh, compilation. And uh, I'll give you a little demo of Cordova, actually, because Cordova is the exact same thing. So here we have my, my whatever project that I just created. Let's create a new one. Cordova Create, and it's the same installation and everything. Uh, I don't know, Fubaz. And we'll go to Fubaz, and now, if I wanted to say like go Cordova emulate on iOS, it's gonna fail, so I didn't add iOS. So Cordova is a lot more low level. It, to interact with it, you actually have to be a lot more explicit. It has a ton more commands, and that's a good reason for that because we want other people to cut and paste and hack it up and use it for different purposes. 
Uh, so I'll add a platform, Cordova platform, add iOS. Ah, fuck it, let's add Android and Firefox OS too. Of course, Android's slow, iOS is fast. It's expected behavior. Oh, I totally don't want to download Firefox OS. So get out of there. Okay. So now if I LS and platforms, let's see, I have Android and iOS, and then go like Cordova emulate iOS. It's going to compile. It's going to dump a bunch of shit in my terminal. Oh. And yeah, you didn't see it go there, but it did. Yeah, let's kill it and do it again. Boom. Cool. Let's take a look at the code. So Cordova and PhoneGap projects are identical. Uh, they all have a www folder, which is where you put your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript assets. Um, we did that as a nod to Apache, so it's super ironic that we ended up at Apache in the end. Um, plugins, we'll get into in a bit. Platforms are native platforms, so effectively, while you're authoring your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, every time you run a command, we end up popping it into a platforms directory. So if, you, if people say that PhoneGap's not native, it's not even remotely accurate. Um, this is a native iOS app. This is a native Android app. Uh, merges is a folder that we use to kind of do content negotiation. So if I put uh, an image in here, it'll only get compiled into the Android version. And this is handy if you have like assets that are specific to specific platforms. And hooks are kind of like build hooks. So let's take a look at some HTML because it's such a beautiful thing. I'm gonna kill this. You don't have to do this anymore. You actually don't have to quote attributes in HTML5 either. And, oops, let's kill that, kill it all, which is crafty. Okay, so I'm gonna add an event listener and I'm gonna listen for device ready. This is fired once we've established a bridge between the native and the uh, web view code. Uh, it's kind of like DOM content loaded, except for it loads after DOM content loaded and after we've done a bridge. And because I'm a JavaScript programmer, I'm going to do some debugging. <laughs> I'm glad you guys laughed at that. Sometimes people get pissed. <laughs> All right. Oh. Come on, iOS, I don't have time for this shit. All right. I don't know why, but that emulator's been goofy since the last update. There we go. And boom. So there's a problem with this. And that problem is this looks kind of sketchy. Um, it's accurate. We actually did just alert from index HTML, but if someone sees that in the App Store, they're going to think you're a, a cheese ball. So. How do we fix that? Well, we're going to have to go native. Um, I'm going to jump over to the PhoneGap docs, and we have plugins for just about anything that you can think of. Um, so I'm going to go check out the plugin APIs for the officially supported stuff. And we happen to have native dialogues if we want them. And so here's the native dialogues plugin. I'm just going to copy and paste Cordova plugin add. I'm going to install this plugin. So we've got this plugin registry. Um, I'll show it to you in a second, it's, it's huge. And it gives me all these different dialogues. So navigator.notification.alert, that's cool. Uh, let's go. Whoa. Trash, interesting. All right, let's go take a look down here. So we've got our device ready. We did our, our web browser alert, which was probably a bad idea. I'm just gonna push this back. You don't have to use Vim, by the way, if you're a phone gap developer. It's just my own habit. Um, I'm going to give it a message. Let's see, what should we say? Hi from native code. I'm not going to give it a callback because I don't care. Um, let's give it a custom title. And we can name that button whatever we want. So how about we just say peace. And 
going to kill this simulator because I'm aggressive like that. I'm going to go Cordova emulate iOS. It's going to compile. It's going to throw it onto the simulator. It's going to launch. It's going to do the bad alert first. And then you can see I've got this native custom alert here. Now, that's pretty neat. Neat parlor trick, bro. But what if I did Cordova run Android? It's, it's still building, maybe. It's dexing, which sounds way cooler than it is. Come on. And there you go. So there's our first alert. Beautiful Android native UI, second alert. Um, yeah, so that's plugins. And if you go to our, uh, if you go to plugins.cordova.io, you can see our plugins uh, registry. It's kind of bad, uh, so we started to redesign it. Oh, you should not see that URL. Um, <laughs> this is being recorded, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> So this is a new Cordova plugins registry. There's about uh, 200 of them out there in the wild. Um, some of them get downloaded more than others. Uh, if there's some form of native functionality that you require access to in a particular project, uh, there's a very high probability that we've already implemented against it. And yeah, it's all open source in there for you to use. So um, Apache Cordova. Uh, Apache Cordova is our guts, and it's at the Apache Software Foundation, which is a non-for-profit um, foundation for software. Uh, they have the assets, uh, the trademark, and all the IP for our source code. One of the things that makes Apache a little different than some foundations is it's comprised solely of individuals. Uh, there's no companies that run anything that's going on there, and so all those individuals sort of share a set of principles uh, about working together. We believe in collaborative software development of individuals on their merit of actually writing code. Uh, we believe in a commercially friendly license, so just because it's open source doesn't mean it can't affect business. The Apache license, in my opinion, is probably the best license because it allows for patentability. It also means that we're granting you the ability to use it while still retaining the IP. Um, Apache's got a, a real high bar for, high, uh, for writing consistently good software, so lots of rigor around testing. Um, we believe in respectful, technical-based, honest communication. This is kind of bullshit. It doesn't always happen that way, but generally, um, people are nice. Uh, we, in the Cordova project, have a no-asshole rule. Um, it's just not acceptable. I mean, programming's hard enough. We don't need to work with dicks. Um, the thing that attracted me the most to Apache was the fact that it, the web servers obviously played a huge role in uh, standards. And PhoneGap and Cordova is all about the standards-based development. When we did the initial version of PhoneGap back in 0 0.8, uh, we, we immediately added the capability to have geolocation. And then we realized that if we did this, we were locking ourselves into our own platform, which was kind of against the idea. Um, one of the ideas of PhoneGap is that we wanted to cease to exist. We were just building this thing while web browsers caught up. And so we implemented the geolocation spec. And what's cool about that, the PhoneGap apps that targeted 0.8.0 run in the browser today. We implemented geo before browsers did. And now that browsers do it, those, that code was portable out of there. I'm proud of that. Uh, security is a mandatory feature. We have a really good security disclosure policy and, and how we operate at Apache. Getting into Apache is actually pretty big pain in the ass. They have what's called an incubation process where we go through all the IP and make sure all of it is buttoned up and that everybody that's contributing uh, kind of follows the principles. And just because it's made up of individuals doesn't mean that there isn't sponsoring companies. So this is the, the real power of a foundation for software. Um, because we're in this legal neutral ground, all of these different companies have contributors um, joining us. So Adobe's got about 20 people working on PhoneGap. BlackBerry has six working on a thing called WebWorks, which is a distribution of Cordova. Google's uh, Chrome packaged apps for mobile are based on Cordova, and they've got about 10 people working on it. Microsoft OpenTech has people. IBM, Intel, Mozilla's got Firefox OS, and LG, believe it or not, are now the stewards of WebOS. I don't know if you remember that. Um, and that's on TVs now, believe it or not. Cadence is a big thing for us. Um, so cadence is how often we ship. When we first started PhoneGap, we started at like 0 0.1, we went up to 0 0.8, and then we stalled on 0 0.8, honestly, for like a year and a half. 
And people would come to us and be like, I have a bug. And I'd be like, oh, that's weird. I can't, I can't reproduce that bug. What version are you? Oh, that's right. <laughs> so really, releases and version numbers, the smaller they are, the higher likelihood you have of being able to identify correct and make sure that you don't have that bug ever come back again. And if you leave releases too long, then a release becomes this big event and it becomes a problem. So we started to ship a lot. Um, now, I think last year we shipped 67 times. Uh, this cadence is great for not only us, but it's good for the people that depend on us. So if there's a bug, they know it's going to get addressed in the next release. If there's a security issue, it's going to get fixed really quickly. And our community is used to like seeing us pump out these releases. So I've got a, this, all these slides, by the way, are online. I've linked up like the thinking behind a lot of this stuff, which I encourage you to read. Contributing is super easy. Um, if you go to GitHub slash Apache. And you can just like search by Cordova. And you can see we, we've got a lot of repos. Um, but it's just like the GitHub model. You just fork whatever, and then we'll get a pull request in, and uh, you're good to go. That's basically all there is to it. Um, contributing is fun. There's plenty of places to contribute to. But if you do it enough, we're going to make you a committer so that you can just contribute yourself. Uh, becoming a committer at Apache is kind of an honor. You get an Apache email address and you get the ability to interact with any of the projects that are at Apache. There's a lot of them and they're doing very cool things. Uh, if, you know, if it's not obvious by now, we, we kind of love Apache. It's been great. It's been an excellent neutral ground for us to, to really develop PhoneGap and see that it lives. So Cordova is this lower level thing. Uh, people use it. You don't have to. Uh, it's kind of hard to use because there's a lot going on. And we've got this concept of working in a platform versus a project. Cordova's kind of like working with the actual lowest level bits. You're working with iOS, you're working with Android. Where PhoneGap, you're kind of working at a higher level. You're working with just web code, and you don't have to know about the lower level bits. And it's totally up to you. Uh, when I installed those plugins earlier, I was actually using a tool called Plugman, which is a really nice tool for dealing with uh, instrumenting native code. Uh, it does all of our installation and removal stuff. The real question everyone asks me these days, so you know, we know the web can be native-ish, we know we can build these apps, and that's great. But the real question is, can we build apps that are decent? I mean, I've just been building Hello Worlds there, and that shit's not hard. Sophisticated apps um, take a lot more effort. So we were asking this question a lot at Adobe, and I started to analyze a great deal of our apps that we had in PhoneGap build, and um, we came to the conclusion that it, it can be done, uh, but it takes a different type of discipline than we were used to when we are developing for the web uh, for desktop. And specifically, a lot of people were kind of leaning on frameworks like Twitter Bootstrap, which is a great framework, but it wasn't built necessarily with mobile apps in mind. It was built with desktop websites in mind. I know it's responsive. That doesn't make it's good for apps. So we started to look at, like, what are all these performance considerations, and what can we do to make things better? We looked at the network, and the network is problematic because you're never necessarily always connected. There's this sort of occasionally connected scenario that where you might be online, you might be offline. Um, Twitter bootstraps a megabyte of CSS, by the way. It's a lot of CSS to load for buttons. Um, execution time is another problem. Uh, this is not as big of a problem. Web browsers are getting better all the time. JavaScript is pretty fast at this point, but the CPU is not too great. Uh, the real kind of devil in the details is layout. So every time I manipulate the DOM, I'm having to repaint all the pixels on the screen, which can get really expensive, especially if I'm adding a lot of stuff to the DOM. So I sat down with the beer and cried. I was like, network's slow, <laughs> execution's slow, layout slow. Uh, Luke Wabruski proposed the idea of mobile first. So instead of developing for this big desktop and then trying to cram it down into mobile, we start with mobile and then we build it out and we might get the most optimal experience by doing that. And I like that idea except for the problem is we don't really know what the hell mobile means anymore. You know, at first there was tablets but now there's like watches and people are putting computers on their face and we don't really know what's, where it's going to go. And we probably can't begin to predict where it's going to go. A Google Glass uses a web view. So I started a rant about performance first. Everything's got to be about performance. We're going to measure everything, we're going to benchmark and we're going to make this shit fast by default. And the team started to write, you know, when you start measuring something, then your team will start actually doing it. Like, you know, if, you, if you're measuring, like, code coverage, all of a sudden you're going to have so many tests and it's going to be super slow. And if all you're managing is, like, number of issues, well, all of a sudden your issue tracker is going to be full of issues. And it turns out if all you measure is performance, people start writing really performant but terribly hard to maintain code. So I killed that idea. I was like, what are we going to do? I mean, we need to write maintainable code. That's super important. 
I know, we'll go like people first. You know, this is all about like us working together and we're still gonna think mobile and we're still gonna think performance. It was like I applied all my Adobe management training in one brilliant moment and I came up with mobile performance people first. <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. Anyway, so productivity, that is a big thing though. And I don't know, Liza Danger Gardner had this awesome blog post a little while ago, do as little as possible. And I like that philosophy. Uh, we had, a, and I don't mean it because I'm a lazy Canadian. Um, so we had a client come to us at Nitobi once, and they're like, "Imagine if you had all the features of Facebook times 10." I'm like, "That sounds horrible, <laughs> right? Like that's a bad app." Uh, Liza's idea is that we just need to focus on doing one thing and one thing great. I think of Uber is a really good example of this. I press a button, and all of a sudden, a magical car picks me up and drops me off. That's that's great design. There's pretty much no denying that the fastest code is no code. And it's the easiest to test, too. So getting back to measuring things uh, and measuring absolutely everything, this became super important to us. Uh, we, yeah, we also looked at like the maintenance and extending and upgrading new platforms. Anyone here deployed a Twitter bootstrap website? Yeah, you have. Just admit it. OK, did anyone here manage to upgrade it to three? Two people. How was that? Oh yeah? Sweet. None of the class name changes bothered you at all? Well, well there you go. Hire that man. <laughs> um, we had other main motivations. Adobe's building lots of apps internally. We're, we're building apps using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and we wanted to have a consistent foundation across the board for everything that we're doing. We also want to give PhoneGap developers something to start with. Um, so Topcoat, the first crack at it, we built the Adobe Max application. We didn't actually admit that we were building a PhoneGap app, and we shipped it. There was 5,000 people using it. It felt super slick and native. Everyone loved it, and no one believed that it was a PhoneGap app. So when, kind of, we should have been more open about that. Uh, this was the basis for everything. Um, and then we went back and we threw all that code away, and we started thinking about, like, what are our d actual design goals? So we wanted to compose builds down to just the bits you need, not all the stuff. Um, there's no point in including all of Twitter Bootstrap if all you're going to use is the buttons. Wanted to make it modular, so a lot of CSS components tend to combine layout, reset, and aesthetic, making theming really hard, and you end up with dogpiling. So you'll, you'll have like the developer who will like copy and paste the button, and then he'll just change it slightly and put it underneath the other one, add an important, maybe a Z-index. This is not good, it's not modular. And we wanted to build extensible tooling, and this part is actually a pretty cool story. So if you go to the Topcoat website, um, I started talking to Paul Aris, I'm like, listen, I need to measure everything. Like, how do I get into the guts of CSS and actually look at what's going on? And he's like, well, we do have this thing called telemetry, but it's only available if you do your own build of Chrome, and uh, if you script against Python, it's totally undocumented, which is like right up my alley. I was totally into it. So we created this benchmarking server, which would only measure layout time, load time, and then the mean time frame, uh, frames per second. And so every commit, we'd add one control to the page, and we'd scroll it up and down super fast. And then we'd add 200 controls to the page and scroll it up and down really fast. And then we would add all controls to the page and scroll it up and down really fast. And we were pulling these numbers, and we'd know when we slowed it down. This right here is proof that legal slows you down. This is where we added the license header. And then we're like, oh, wait, you don't need to add that. We got rid of it. So being empirical is kind of neat. Um, let me show you some of the top coat controls so you can get a sense of what, what they look like. Uh, we pulled a lot of this from Adobe styling. It's, it's possible to theme it in any way that you want. You don't have to make it look Adobe-ish at all. And it's just basic lists and buttons and switches and stuff. Um, I'm not trying to sell you on using this, by the way. If people just start approaching their CSS from this kind of craftsman perspective, that's good enough for me. What we're really trying to do is see better apps get built for the web. Uh, another thing that we did, uh, and this one was controversial, people are like, you can't do CSS without a bunch of JavaScript. Yeah, it turns out you can. And it's probably a good idea. You, people have different types of uh, libraries that they're into. Some people like jQuery, most people like Zepto, it doesn't really matter. Um, we didn't want to touch that, that's up to you. And of course it's Apache 2 licensed. So I'm gonna quickly show it to you. Am I doing okay for time? Yeah, I am. All right, let's get out of the trash. So, actually, oops. 
So here in my source code, I've got a copy of top code. I'm gonna copy that. I'm actually gonna generate a project first. Uh, Longgap create top code thing. Great. So I got top code thing, www. I'm just gonna dump the whole thing in uh, for now, just cause I'm lazy. Uh, you wouldn't do that in a normal scenario. And I'm gonna go mobile dark. And we generate these style guides. So uh, if I want a list, I can just grab this. And now I'm gonna go into Whoops. Top coat thing. I'm going to jump into my www. This big old mess of an index, HTML, which I'm going to kill all of it. You're gone. We'll add that list. HTML is beautiful. And let's add the style sheet. It's in top coat dash zero dot eight dot zero. Whoops. Zero. Oh God. <laughs> slash CSS slash top coat dash mobile dark. I better check that. Topcoat dash mobile dark dot CSS. Yeah. Cool. Oops. Bunch of crazy compiling. So there's a list. You know, that's not mind-blowing, but gives you a sense of how quick and easy it is to start prototyping up an interface. Um, and we've got example apps that run the gamut. Uh, usually people do the hamburger menu thing, and there's at least four or five of those out there. Kind of the real point, uh, or the thing that's interesting to me, Google's got Chrome OS. Uh, yesterday, Microsoft talked a great deal about WinJS. Obviously, there's a thing called Firefox OS, ties in, and then there's WebOS, which is kind of a sad story. But what's cool about that, you've got Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, Samsung, Intel, and uh, LG all working on a next generation set of operating systems that use the web as their basis. So it's good news for web developers. And in the meantime, we can cover the rest with full gap. Um, one thing, I got in trouble for this once. They were like, oh, that was a pot shot. But it's just true. This isn't me like being mean or anything. But every one of those app stores uses embedded web view. It's kind of funny. There's like perceived competition. I don't really subscribe to the idea of competition in open source projects. We learn and steal from each other. And that's you know progressing the art. That's what it's all about. Um, everyone has strengths and opinions. And there's no right or wrong answers here. I've used all of these projects. And they're all appropriate for different reasons. Uh, we give you these outputs, so you get CSS, you get our grunt-based tooling. Uh, because we're Adobe, we have a PSD. Um, there's icons, there's SVG stuff that we've been doing. We haven't done any JavaScript yet. I showed you the uh, benchmarking server that we have. This is open source now, and actually Firefox and our Mozilla and Microsoft are going to be adding telemetry data to their browsers. And Open Tech at Microsoft has taken this, and they've built this thing called Grunt Telemetry, which allows you to do these builds where you can see your CSS performance getting better or worse, uh, which is super useful. Uh, right now, we're saying the platform support are the evergreen browsers, so browsers that update themselves. We're not really concerned uh, with IE6 on any phones. Probably not going to happen. Uh, you can use all of it, or you can use none of it. We're not really worried about it. Uh, there's been some concerns over the technology trade-offs that we've made. Um, I don't know. We. We don't, you don't have to use our stuff, right? Like you, you, can, you can use it, you can throw it away, you can fork it, that's, a, that's the whole point of open source. The, a lot of people have asked us about responsive design and PhoneGap in particular, we just stretch the web view to the size of the thing it's running on. So if you build for iOS and you, you launch on an iPad, it's gonna stretch the web view to that size. So media queries work, which I think is basically the fundamental basis of all responsive design thinking. Um, but that's an exercise up to you. We're not gonna tell you how to write your app. 
There's three frameworks out there that I think are worth investigating. Uh, these days, they're kind of the popular ones we hear about the most. Um, Ionic, really interesting. They wrote their own CSS, but they actually use a lot of the thinking from Topcoat, which is great. Um, and it's based on Angular and Cordova. So uh, it's like two commands to create a hamburger menu on like four platforms. It's amazing. Um, Monaka is from Japan, from this dude named Masahiro-san, who's a buddy of ours. And he took Angular and Topcoat and mashed it up and built um, his framework, which is great. And then Telerik's a sponsor, and John Bristow is a friend of mine, so I'm going to give them props. Thanks, John. He's not even here. What a dick. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, dude. He's here. Now I feel like a dick. <laughs> Uh, the Topco roadmap, we're actually working on uh, a whole bunch of stuff right now. This might be of interest to you. If you've seen Effect.js, it's a project from Paul Irish. Uh, we combined it with Topco so to give you like, uh, I don't know, animations as a default. Just neat ideas. Uh, some of it is kind of precious. I don't know that I would like do this with a list on mobile. It would probably piss me off. But um, some of it's really cool, like, you know, this type of thing. You want that out of the box, and you want it to look great, and you want it to be easy to do. So yeah, we're working on integrating that and having that functionality based, uh, built into it out of the box. Um, it seems like Angular has kind of been popular lately, and so we've been working on Angular uh, directives using Topcoat. Uh, in our roadmap, and this is the part I'm most excited about, uh, we haven't launched this yet. Uh, so there's not much you can do, but if you go to app.phonegap.com, um, we have this sort of preview page up. We've submitted apps to all the app stores. In the current way that I showed you how to build PhoneGap apps, you still have to install SDKs and stuff. In the new way, you install an app on your phone, and then we have a local development server that will pair with it, and it'll automatically refresh as you're doing development. So you don't need to install any SDKs. You just install an app, and, and you're good to go. Um, this should be out in the next week or two. Uh, we've been having some back and forth with Apple on it, so uh, I anticipate it to be ready soon. Uh, the other big thing that we've worked on uh, just recently was an accessibility plugin. So we've been working with Adobe Accessibility Team to see that PhoneGap actually has good accessibility support. Um, that just recently launched. Yeah, so Cordova, low-level guts, uh, PhoneGap, higher-level business, and uh, Topcoat might be useful to you. Thanks. Uh, I did for time there. I was pretty close. If you guys have any questions? <laughs> or are you saying get out of here? No, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> got two minutes. Oh, so he wants to know a little bit about debugging. So debugging is a lot better than it was, uh, which isn't to say that it's great. So um, on newest version Androids, KitKat and up, you have full remote debugging capability. iOS, we've had it for a few releases. Uh, Windows Phone, we've had it for a while. So you can do that. Interestingly, in the beginning, when we had no debugging whatsoever, it forced us to write a lot of unit tests. And I kind of actually prefer that as a method for debugging myself now. It's an easier way to reason about what's going on. Stepping into and through code is still something you have to do, though. And yeah, it's fully supported by PhoneGap and all the tooling. Yeah, there's two ways. Yeah, so we use Apple iWeb Inspector or whatever, or Web Inspector with Safari. Uh, that's if you're running a Mac. We do have a remote debugger that you can use at emulate.phonegap.com, and it's based on an old fork of DevTools, and we inject code into the, the phone. It's, called, it's based on a thing called Winery, which is not super supported anymore. It's a part of the PhoneGap project, so if you want to do remote debugging into a device, it's totally possible. Uh, you, if you're getting into that type of thing, though, you're going to want to install the native tools and do it locally. Uh, one more question, Randall. Yeah, I've got good news. So you can, in, oh, the question was, uh, what's up with WebGL, basically? So I've got good news. Uh, you can enable WebGL, but it's not legit uh, in iOS. However, in Android, uh, in Android KitKat with Chrome View, it's not enabled either. But recently, we've got builds working where you can include your own version of Chromium or Gecko View uh, on Android. So it's possible to do it there. The problem with this approach, we haven't really documented this yet, but the problem with it, you end up including an entire web browser for every app. 
And I think Chromium compiled for mobile right now weighs in at about 17 megs and Firefox is somewhere up in the 30 megs spot. So if you're building a game, like hell yeah, who cares? But you know, it depends on your application and what you wanna do. I imagine, I can't imagine that the next version of Chrome wouldn't come with it turned on and that will force Apple to turn it on. And then we know IE 11 has it turned on, so you're good to go there. And it's probably enabled in BlackBerry, but no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, thank you.